A.C. bought a home in suburban Chicago, and he became a fairly successful independent contractor. Now, in 1978, after one of Gacy's victims was reported missing, police learned that Gacy was the last person known to have seen this guy. After obtaining a search warrant, police discovered the bodies of 29 boys and young men in a crawl space beneath Gacy's house. Indeed, that area of the house just emitted of a foul stench for years, and people complained about it, neighbors, guests. But he told his house guests that the smell was from the result of moisture buildup. Yeah. Yes. In the end, 26 victims were found buried within this crawl space. Three others were found buried elsewhere on the property, while the fourth victim, uh, there was four more victims, um, they were discarded in the De Plains River. They were not even on his property at all. Gacy ended up spending 14 years on death row for his crimes, and he was eventually um, executed, which he, I think he deserved, by lethal injection on May 10th, 1994. Unfortunately, his house went into despair and it was eventually demolished in 1979. There was a new home built in its place in 1988. However, it was said that his former home was insanely haunted and people that had a chance to go through it claimed to hear screamings of young boys and even witnessed an apparition of a large man dressed in a clown outfit wandering through the house. Oh, that'd be creepy. Very creepy. <laughs> and of course, we must wonder if the owners of the new home built on top of this marred land have had any strange occurrences happen. Okay, Kristen. My favorite is next. This is my favorite. Your absolute favorite? Yes. Well, that is Jeffrey Dahmer. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> he was not only considered a serial killer, but was also a cannibal and was of the name the Milwaukee Cannibal. He also <laughs> didn't just kill his victims. He <laughs> tortured, raped, and then dismembered them as well. As well as ate some of the parts. <laughs> <laughs> Well, he ended up taking the lives of 17 men between the years of 1978 through 1991. And over the course of this 13-year span, Dahmer sought out mostly African-American men at bars, malls, and bus stops. He would then lure them home with promises of money or sex and would give them alcohol laced with drugs when they arrived. Then he would strangle them to death. Oh, my. Well, then he would engage in sexual acts with the corpses before dismembering them and disposing of them. However, he often kept their skulls or genitals as souvenirs. Gruesome. <laughs> <laughs> and he frequently took photos of his victims at various stages of the murder process so he could recollect each act afterward and relive the experience. Ugh. So as a child, Dahmer was described as an energetic and happy kid until the age of four when he had a surgery to correct a double hernia that seemed to have caused a change within him. He then became subdued and withdrawn following the birth of his younger brother and the frequent moves his family made. <coughs> and by his early teens, he was disengaged, tense, and unfriendly. His compulsions towards necrophilia and murder began around the age of 14, but it appears his parents' divorce a few years later made those thoughts actually turn into actions. Yes. So his first murder actually took place in 1978 at the age of 18, when he picked up a hitchhiker and took him to his parents' house where he tortured and killed him. His next victim wouldn't be taken until almost 10 years later, 1987. And with that, folks, we will be right back with more about Jeffrey Dahmer after this short break. You are listening to Ghost Talk Radio on WBHM Digital Broadcasting.
You are listening to WPHM Digital Broadcasting. The best in paranormal talk radio. Twenty-three minutes past the hour. Welcome back to Ghost Talk Radio. With me is your host Shelley Robertson, and joining me tonight is Kristen Boyd. If you just tuned in, we invite you all to join us in chat at wbhm-db.com, where you can ask us any questions you may have. Now we have been discussing serial killers and the hauntings that surround them. If you missed the first part of our show, no worries, folks. You can catch the full show archive on Spreaker, Google Play, iTunes, and iHeartRadio at your leisure. Now, before the break, we were discussing Jeffrey Dahmer. And, of course, he is my favorite. And I'm going to let you continue on with that, Kristen, because he's just fascinating fascinating and gruesome. (laughs) So, carry on with Jeffrey Dahmer. All right. So, Dahmer's killing spree ended when he was arrested on July 22nd, 1991. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, that day, two police officers picked up a 32-year-old man who was wandering the streets with a handcuff dangling from his wrist. They decided to investigate his claims that a weird dude had drugged him. When he directed them to Dahmer's apartment... Dahmer calmly offered to get the keys for the handcuffs. The officers then noticed Polaroid photos of dismembered bodies lying around. Oh, goodness. <laughs> Key indicator there. Yes. The officer, oh, at this point, Dahmer was subdued by the officers. An additional search ended up revealing a head in the refrigerator, three more in the freezer, along with preserved skulls, jars containing genitalia, and an extensive gallery of disturbing Polaroid photos. And, you know, I saw some of those crime scene photographs, and there were gutted bodies yes. in the bathroom, and I see. it was very gruesome. Yes, very much so. Well, Dahmer was sentenced to 16 life terms. Mm, yes. But in 1994, he was killed by a fellow inmate who had actually beat him to death. Now, Dahmer was originally from Bath, Ohio, and his childhood home is rumored to be insanely haunted to, due to it being the site of his first grisly murder, where he brought home a hitchhiker, strangled him, then dismembered him and scattered his bones over the property. Now, it is said that Dahmer himself, along with other spirits, have been witnessed there. It is also said to be one of the best locations ever to pick up EVPs. Mm, Interesting. Well, his childhood home has been recently purchased. Yes, and I remember when it went up for sale. I wanted to buy it and live there so bad. That would have been been very cool. Right. But it can be rented out for $10,000 a month. For any of you investigators that want to do some oh, serious paranormal uh, That's very serious for <laughs> 10 grand a month, I must tell you. Yeah. Which brings us to one that I know everybody's heard of, and that is Richard Ramirez, known as the Night Stalker. Now, everybody's heard of him, I'm sure. I think so. Now, Ramirez committed his first murder in April of 1984, and he was 24 at the time. He continued his killing spree over the span of a year before getting caught in August of 1985. His favorite place to choose his victims was around the L.A. area. And one was um, one other place was that he used to use actually as a refuge was the Cecil Hotel and the Cecil Hotel in itself, folks. It is a very interesting place and probably haunted like nobody's business. And it's been depicted in movies and everything else. Anyways, this was Ramirez's favorite place to go. Now, 
Ramirez was born on February 29, 1960, and as an adolescent, he was heavily influenced by his older cousin, Miguel, who had recently returned from fighting in the Vietnam War. Now, Miguel told Ramirez about the torture and the mutilation that he had inflicted on several Vietnamese women, okay, proving to him that he actually did it by showing him pictures he had taken. So then at the age of 13, he witnessed his cousin, Miguel, murder his own wife. And it was around 1977, after being caught with possession of marijuana, that he moved to California, where he became addicted to cocaine and burglary, and also cultivated an interest in sadism. Now, this interest actually became a calling card for investigators at the crime scenes. Ramirez's first known murder was on June 28, 1984, and the victim was 79-year-old Jenny Vincow, who he sexually assaulted, stabbed, and he killed her during a burglary in her home. Ramirez was a Satanist as well, and seemed to have no M.O. except to be a, as sadistic as possible when he killed people. Now, his victims included men, women, and children who were chosen randomly and killed in a variety of different ways with whatever weapon was handy at the time and often taking place after a sexual assault. He was ultimately caught after he left a rape victim alive and she got a look at his getaway car, which was a stolen Toyota, and she turned this information into the police. Now, the car was found abandoned, and it was connected to Ramirez by one single fingerprint, folks. Dang. That was his mistake, one, one single fingerprint. One fingerprint. Once the suspect was in custody, they broadcasted his name everywhere, and they called him, okay? And he was immediately recognized, and he ended up being beaten by a mob in East Los Angeles after everybody heard all.